Chipping a large model like this can be time consuming and exhausting. Luckily there are techniques that can make this process faster and easier. As you might know, chipping is a process that employs several techniques and today we'll take a look at the first step. So sit back and open a bag of potato chips because today we're painting the first layer of light superficial chips. That was lame. What's up mate, seems like we're gonna do a lot of work on this model today and my entire body is exhausted just by thinking about it. But before we start, here's a quick summary of each step. Sponge chipping. Brush chipping. Texture filter. Speckling. That's quite a lot of work, but we'll get it done in no time. For the first two layers, we'll be using white and German yellow Vallejo paints. And of course, drying retarder from AK and some tap water as well. Let's mix a nice light paint. Six drops German yellow, two drops white, two drops retarder, one drop tap water. The resulting mixture will be visible enough and won't deviate too much from the desaturated yellowish green base coat. Drying retarder will make it dry slower, so the paint won't dry up in my palette after a few minutes. I prepared a few pieces of kitchen sponge and no, this is not another Eastern European ghetto solution. These are legit painting tools for the first chipping stage. It's extremely important to remove most of the paint on a piece of paper until the sponge leaves just a faint random trace like this. Let's get to work. I find it best to start working on less visible parts like in this case the lower hull. A lot of this will be hidden behind road wheels, tracks and earth effects, but a few chips will remain visible here and there. And because of that it's a perfect place to start and try out different techniques. I mean, not just new techniques, but... It can take weeks or even months until you get to chip your next model and you might lose some of that touch in your hand. So there's another benefit. You can use the lower hall as a warm-up lap. I think it's also good to keep in mind that these parts are in direct line of fire from mud, earth and stones, which will slowly wear down the paint job. That's why it's quite okay if you go a little heavier than usually here. Unfortunately, lower hulls and tank wheels are one of the most forgotten parts on armor models, mainly because modelers just cover them with mud and dust. And hey, that's perfectly okay, but still. A little bit less of that and a little bit more washes and chips will create more dramatic looking model, at least in my opinion. And speaking of wheels, in most cases sponge is the only technique you need to quickly paint chips on these parts. Of course you'll have to use your brush to add those darker steel chips later, but because a lot of those are usually gonna get covered with mud and dust zones, it's nice to save some time with this technique. So I think now we can safely move on to the upper hull. At this point I've become more accustomed to the sponge and I'm saying this because I haven't used sponge for years, until recently when I was filming that chipping tutorial, so now feeling more relaxed I started to add chips on these more visible parts. As you might have noticed I'm mainly adding chips around the edges. That's where chips will naturally appear and coincidentally the sponge creates a really nice effect here. But then of course I also move on to the center of the panel to add a few chips there as well. Sponge helps you to quickly create nice random shapes and patterns and I think it's a really clever way of adding chips if your time is limited. Mine definitely is since I have to upload each week. Some people like to use sponge around hatches in a more professional manner by masking off the hatch with a piece of tape and then adding chips around it. I, however, like to paint those with a paintbrush, we'll get to that in a moment. So therefore I'm just using sponge here as another quick way of adding large amounts of random flakes which will make my life easier. It's also worth mentioning that lots of these small chips will get toned down a lot with the upcoming steps. So even if the amount might be too much, as long as you keep them in scale, aka small, it'll be fine. In fact, it'll be more than fine. It'll be actually really cool, because you'll end up with lots of small details in your paint job. Another thing is that this is gonna be an abandoned vehicle that's been sitting under the sky for some time. So I think the effect will be more than appropriate. Sponge is also extremely effective on these air intake louvers, 
I used to chip parts such as these with brush, one by one, and let's just say it wasn't a lot of fun. Of course these will need some refining with brush later and most of them are gonna be filled with dark steel chips which are gonna be applied exclusively with brush in the next video, but still, chipping them like this just felt so satisfying. Small exposed details like tool clamps and other tiny stuff including photo edge details are also very easy to chip this way. Basically anything that has a small surface and nice sharp edges makes sponge a god tier technique. The best thing about sponge is that making lots of natural looking chips on large flat parts is super easy. If you have a big open plane with minimal amount of detail, it can be often very tricky to paint good looking chips by hand. Now I just realized how easy my life could have been if I decided to use this technique on my ball tank which had no edges and barely any surface details. It's also interesting how a few years ago I was strongly against this technique. Not that I openly discouraged people from using it, it was more of my own personal refusal to use it, because I preferred to paint every chip with brush so I could become better at this technique. But now with my limited time I find this technique extremely useful. And I'm for sure not alone here. We all know how busy our lives can get. So maybe I'll keep using this sponge thingy on my future models as well. Okay, the result of the first stage of chipping looks like this. To create this amount of chips by brush would normally take me at least a week, but probably even more. Applying them this way took only about 2 hours. But the effect needs to be refined and there are still 3 other techniques that I'll employ in this video, so let's move on to the next step, brush painted chips. Let's once again use the same acrylic mixture, aka 6 drops of German yellow, um, these are supposed to be 2 drops of white, 2 drops of acrylic retarder and 1 drop of tap water. The most efficient way is to start by outlining each panel with the side of your brush. Turn the model around if you need to, it's important to be as comfortable as you can. Then you can start expanding some of the worn edges towards the center. Those sponge applied chips will serve as your guide and make this process a lot faster and easier. So we're basically just highlighting those worn edges and then connecting some of the smaller sponge applied flakes into slightly bigger chips. The entire process is quite straightforward, but it takes some patience. And let me now just talk for a while. I know I talk all the time on this channel, but I'd like to explain a few things about chipping. This model represents a prototype that was tested by the Japanese, then captured by Americans after the war, shipped to the US, probably tested even more and then stored outside for some time before it was melted into cutlery. There are several black and white photos of this tank and most of them show it in a pretty pristine condition without any visible paint damage. However, there's one very low quality photo that shows this tank parked in a scrapyard along with Type 4 Cheeto and some other Japanese vehicles. So I decided to paint the model like that, sitting outside for some time, which gives me more freedom with weathering. Because there are no high quality pictures showing this tank rotting away, I'm working with photos of other tanks that have been left to decay for a while. Most of them show larger randomly placed chips and fair amount of rust, but we'll add that in another video. There's also something I mention in every chipping video. Yes, I know my chipping isn't realistic. In fact, I don't even think I make realistic models at all. Of course I take a lot of inspiration from reality and I study references whenever I can, but I always try to make stuff a little bit more interesting than that, simply because I just want to have as much fun with every model as I possibly can. Like I said earlier, painting chips around hatches can be done with a sponge, but you have to use some masking tape. And because I hate masking and enjoy working with brushes, my preferred method is to just paint small chips around them like this. The way I'm painting these very light chips over the fake dark outline I made in the previous video might look weird to say the least, but just wait until I add the darker steel chips and some faint rust zones, that will be something, trust me. 
Oh, and I'm also using it to cover up those mysterious cracks I mentioned before. Turns out it's quite effective. The damage fender was chipped the same way. I first outlined all of its edges and then added a few more chips to the center of each panel. I might add some larger flakes later, but for now I want to play it safe. I'll decide if it needs some more when the dark chips and rust effects are in place. Those missing fenders at the front were probably welded to the hull, and therefore they must have left some unpainted spots. I decided to use masking tape to paint the outline and then add some more random texture inside. This will also create an interesting effect once combined with steel chips and rust stones. And because this is gonna be a vehicle that hasn't been used in a while, I presume the running gear won't be covered with that much earth tones, so I quickly added some more refined chips on the wheels as well. Alright, the model starts to look a little bit more interesting now. The chipping isn't so chaotic and all over the place anymore and we could already move on and start adding the steel chips. But I like to use a few extra techniques to enhance the effect. So let's mix a very light yellow from Wilder oil paints. I had to experiment for a little while to get a close match, but after a few minutes I had a color that was almost identical with the acrylic mixture I used before. Let's put that mixture aside for now and mix some of it with large amount of enamel thinner to get the consistency of a filter, which is a very thin paint, like 10% paint, 90% thinner. It should look something like this, and if you're already guessing what I'm gonna do with it, then you're completely right. That is, if your guess was speckling. Applying filters in this manner creates a very faint but very nice jumbled effect. It works in conjunction not only with chipping, but also with the distressing I created with airbrush and chipping fluid. Yeah, that barely visible distressing which definitely wasn't a waste of time. It also gives the model a more faded, sun bleached look. It's important to note that the effect becomes more visible as the thinner evaporates, so the results won't be visible immediately. Because of its random nature it can create some needlessly large or heavy stains. Therefore it's often necessary to blend it a bit. Here I'm using a large soft brush and enamel thinner to gently tap the surface. Don't worry, you won't remove it. In fact, the paint holds surprisingly well. This step will create a more natural looking result and even if it might still look too strong, there are so many upcoming layers which will tone it down. In fact, most weathering steps are about going back and forth all the time. I learned that if you make every layer nice and smooth it will get covered up by the next one. It's something worth keeping in mind. Let's now use some of that thicker paint. This time the specks should be much smaller and more opaque, just like this. Before you start applying them to your model it's important to remove some of the paint on a piece of paper. This is another quick way of obtaining large amounts of very fine and random looking chips. If this were an operational vehicle used in combat, those would replicate small flakes of paint created by shrapnel, debris and earth flying through the air. In case of this abandoned vehicle is just another way of creating faded and distressed surface. If you look at some rusty things outside you'll notice that rust is often blooming, so to say, through small flakes in paint just like these. Even if you take as many precautions as possible, the effect is still gonna be a little unpredictable, which means you'll always get some overly large dots of paint here and there. And that's exactly why we're using oil paints. Just take a small brush and some enamel thinner and remove any unwanted specks. This step can get a bit funny at times, because it's easy to confuse the oil paint chips with acrylic ones painted before. Just make sure to work with a small brush and small amount of thinner so you can remove just those that you're not happy with. Taking a large brush would result in your removing all or most of them. Another important note here, it's again quite frequently asked question and the answer is no. 
you'll never have to seal anything with a layer of flat varnish. If you give enamels or oils enough time to dry, you won't damage them with the upcoming weathering techniques. Just take this as an example. I added the first speckled layer of textured filters, and then after about an hour, I started adding these small chips. And as you can see, nothing is happening with the previous layer, not to mention the dark wash around details. So don't worry, given enough time to dry, enamels and oils are rock solid. And that brings us to the end of this video. I think I've done everything that can be done to this model at this stage and oof, it was a lot of work. But it's a large model so I should know better next time. But hey, the result is quite rewarding if I do say so myself and now I'm really excited about the next step, which will be adding the dark steel and rusty chips. And to be completely honest with you, I'm totally exhausted after this video, so I'm just gonna leave you guys for now and probably go out and get some of that real life stuff people talk about all the time. Thank you all for watching, I'll see you mates in the next one and here are some bloopers. What's up mates? <clears throat> sponge creates... Sponge helps you... Sponge helps you to... Bleh. Sponge helps you to click... Click click. Another thing is that it's that this is gonna be an event. Another thing is that this is gonna be a blah blah blah. To create this amount of chips by brush would nar normally normally probably tested and evaluated it probably tested and evaluate eva evaluated probably tested and evaluate eva blah. Probably tested and evaluate and evaluate probably probably tested and evaluate eva <laughs> Probably tested and evaluate. E <laughs> probably tested. Probably tested and evaluated. <laughs> Eva evalu evaluated. Evalu evaluated. 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 And evaluated. And evaluated even more. Probably tested and evaluated. <laughs> probably tested and evaluated. Probably. <laughs> I'm just not gonna say it. <laughs>